All right, good afternoon and welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you're not too disappointed to see me standing up on this stage. If you're looking for somebody who is smarter, more intelligent, better looking, and more successful than I'll ever be, um, you know, I hope you're not disappointed that Jim is not standing here. I also hope that somebody tells Jim that I said this about him because he is my boss. Um, anyways, my name's Brian Warner. I work on collaborative projects here at the Linux Foundation. Jim sends his regrets that he can't be here for the rest of the afternoon, so unfortunately you're going to have to listen to me, who's you know, uglier, poorer, and less successful than Jim. Um, with that said, uh, our next speaker today is going to be John Corbett. Um, everybody here, I think, probably knows who John is. He's a longtime Linux kernel contributor, uh, co-founder of LWN, and he's going to talk a little bit about um, recent events in the kernel community, uh, talk about the current state of the kernel and some of the challenges that it's facing, and then also you know, what we can look forward to and how the kernel may address those changes. So with that, I'd like to welcome John up on stage. Let's give him a look. All right, well, if we could get my slides up, not that they matter all that much. Um, thank you all. Good afternoon. Thanks, Brian, for introducing me. You do better than Jim does. I'll tell him I said that. Anyway, I'm here to talk about the kernel. Talk, I call it the kernel report, or we can call it the weather forecast. I shy away from those terms because I'm less reliable than any weatherman you might imagine. But um, I do my best. But we'll start with the report side of things, looking at where, how we got to where we are, from starting from the dim and distant past. And in the kernel community, dim and distant past means about a year ago. Um, so we'll go back to March 18th when the 3.3 .3 kernel came out. And that was a fine kernel. Yeah, but I'm not really going to talk about that. I'm going to talk more about what happened after that, because since the middle of March, when the 3.3 .3 kernel came out, we've done a little bit of stuff. We've, we've been a little bit busy. So the kernel community has merged over 68,000 change sets into the mainline kernel in the course of about 13 months. More than 3,000, almost 3,200 developers have been involved in this, contributing code into the kernel. They work for at least 370 employers that we can actually identify, and probably quite a few more that we can't. We've managed to release five kernels over the course of that period of time, with number six waiting on the wings come out uh, shortly now. And the kernel has grown by about one and a half million lines of code. So that's a fair amount of stuff going on. We've been busy, as usual. It really is kind of just business as usual. Those, those kernel releases I mentioned, they're here. We'll start with 3.3 .3 in March. 3.4 in May, 3.5 in July, 3.6 in September, 3.7 in December, 3.8 is the current kernel, which came out in the middle of February. So we've established this nice regular cadence. You can almost set your clock by, by kernel releases anymore. If you look at this, at this history here, you'll see a couple of things, one of which is that these are all relatively large kernel development cycles. It used to be an exceptional cycle that had more than 10,000 change sets merged. Now it's just routine that we do that. And the number seems to be growing. In fact, 3.8 was our most active development cycle ever, with about 12,400 change sets merged. It's the highest we've ever been thus far. 3.9 instead, which could come out by as soon as this weekend, is setting a different record, because with 1,339 developers involved so far, that's the most developers we've ever had in a single kernel development cycle. So things continue to grow in that regard. But while the process continues to accelerate in this way, I'd like to point out this other column here, which is the days between releases, because something interesting has happened here. And I should really have a longer history, because the time between releases is getting shorter. We are putting out releases more frequently than we used to. If you go back far enough, of course, it used to take us years. But even a couple of years ago, we were running 80, 80 days or so between releases. That's been now shrinking to the point where more than 70 days is pretty much exceptional. And 3.9, which should be 63 days, something like that, will fit right into that pattern. So even though we are getting busier and more active, we've gotten the process so well, so smoothly functioning at this point that we're able to get the releases out more frequently while we're at it and get, get our code out to the users that much more quickly. So there's all kinds of stuff that went into these releases. I could spend the rest of the day just talking about the various features that we have put out there. Don't really have time to do that, although I'll come back to a few of these. But we've done things like essentially fix the buffer bloat problem, at least for wired networking, all done in the open source community 
integrated a lot of code, added a lot of security technologies, improved the networking subsystem, improved file systems in a number of ways. We have RAID 5 and 6 support in the ButterFS file system now. We added things like the 64-bit ARM architecture, a whole new version of ARM, Open vSwitch, virtual networking switch, and so on and so forth. A lot of important stuff has gone into the kernel over the course of this last year. And it just sort of keeps on going. We have a lot of work to do. So if you've seen this talk before, you've seen me put up a slide like this. Still do it. These are the most active employers supporting work on the kernel since version 3.3. So the, that category of none, people working on their own time, remains the most active group. We, that's, they beat any employer. But the percentage of changes coming from people working as volunteers continues to steadily drop over time. And it used to be up somewhat closer to 20% some years ago. And it's just there's a very slow decline in the number of contributions coming from volunteers. I've come to the conclusion that this really reflects our the, the state of the job market and the fact that if you show any ability to get code into the mainline kernel, the only way to stay a volunteer is to really be determined to do so because otherwise um, there will be people in those booths out there offering you jobs. So Red Hat stays at the top of the list of corporate contributors, although not by much. And it's an interesting thing to point out that the 3.9 kernel just about to be released shows Red Hat being displaced by Intel, which actually contributed the most change sets to the 3.9 kernel for the first time around. And we see a lot of other companies here, kind of a, the usual list of you know, folks who contribute to the kernel, companies that, that compete very strongly in the marketplace but collaborate very well at this level. So I just put together a little plot. I've put this up a couple times before. What we're looking at now is percentage contribution versus time for some of the top contributing companies. Since the 2626 kernel, so five, six years worth of history, something like that, the, the lines that I've highlighted represent Samsung and TI and Lenaro, right? They represent three companies working in the mobile and embedded area. So if you look way back at 2626, their contribution was essentially zero. If you look at what's going on now, you see an obvious trend. And I expect that trend to continue as both the importance of mobile and embedded computing grows and as the ability of these companies to work with the development process increases, we'll continue to see more, co more code coming from those folks. This is something I'll come back to in a moment, uh, but once I start to look forward. The summary for the report part really is there's an awful lot going on out there. That's really nothing new in that. And we'll hear more about this from some of the other speakers later in the, in the conference. What I want to do, though, is to look forward, because that's the fun part, and because nobody can really tell me I'm wrong, at least not at the time. Um, you can come back to me later. But the first set of predictions is actually pretty easy. Just like tomorrow's weather forecast is usually just about right. The 3.9 kernel, like I said, is due, if things go well, it's due about this weekend, this coming weekend. So we'll have a new kernel very soon now. Another big development cycle with a lot of interesting stuff, interesting stuff including the, the continuation of the, the effort to eliminate the timer tick for running processes. This is a a technology that's mostly of interest for high-performance computing people and real-time people, where they want to dedicate one or more processors in their system to a single application and have the kernel stay totally out of the way, not even interrupted to keep track of the time and all that. So we're getting closer to being able to support that mode of operation for those sorts of, of crazy folks. We got KV KVM supported in the ARM architecture now on some ARM processors. The SO reuse port is a networking enhancement. It's a scalability thing for people running very large, high bandwidth servers. Helps to, to parallelize the work a bit. Power clamp is a technology out of Intel for managing the power consumption of, of processors. This is meant for, for data center type settings and other sort of high-end environments where you'll have a rack with a specific power and a specific thermal budget. And if you run all of your processors flat out, you can exceed that. So power clamp will actually inject idle cycles into a running system to make it slow down a little bit if you're threatening to exceed your power budget. It's a way of keeping a handle on things like that. DM cache is a new device mapper target. It's a means to interpose a fast device, like a solid state storage device, between the system and a larger storage array, perhaps a rotating storage array. It's a way of increasing storage performance, that sort of thing. And we merged not one, but two new architectures in 3.9. 
the, the ARC architecture and, and Meta, two, two new architectures added 309, and a whole bunch of other stuff that went into this kernel as well. So that's, that's kind of where we stand for specifics. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a relatively small set of, of subject areas in a little bit more detail because they highlight something that I want to point out. So we'll start with scheduling because there's a lot that was, is going on with scheduling. We used to have a lot of fights about CPU scheduling some years ago when we were trying to figure out how you pick which process to run next and try to balance throughput and interactivity and all that. We pretty well solved that problem. There's always, you can always do better. But we don't argue about that anymore. The, the debate with scheduling has shifted to something else. Instead of which process do you run, it's more a question of where do you run it. So to get to that, we'll start by talking about the NUMA problem. So in my typical cheesy artwork sort of form, this is a diagram representing an eight processor system the way people tend to think of it. So you've got something that looks like eight identical CPU cores, each of which has a high bandwidth width path to all of memory, and memory is random access. But increasingly, our systems are not built this way. What you have is something that looks more like this, where you have your cores divided into nodes. So here we have two nodes with four CPUs each in it. There's some memory attached to each node, so it's local to that node. And then the communication between the nodes is this slow channel that's sort of like a couple of tin cans with a string. So what you want to do is you want to keep things local to the nodes whenever you can. So if you have a process running on CPU 1, for example, as long as that process is accessing memory that is local to, to that particular node, to node 0 in this case, everything runs relatively quickly and you're happy. As soon as you start spreading your memory across the system so that you have non-local memory, then you're going over this slow interconnect here and everything slows way, way down. And then you start to run into performance problems. It turns out that Linux doesn't perform as well on this kind of system as we would like still. Despite the fact that the virtual memory subsystem has been trying to allocate node local memory for years and the scheduler tries to avoid moving processes away from their memory, the simple fact of the matter is that you still have to move processes around in the system or you'll inevitably end up in a situation where you have some nodes that are overloaded and others that are sitting idle and then your throughput suffers. So you have to move things around. So you're going to separate processes from their memory or spread their memory around and then performance suffers. So you need to find ways to fix that. So it's being worked on. A number of the people who are working on it are here actually. So in the 3.8 kernel, we got a new framework added, a bunch of infrastructure to let us implement better NUMA balancing and NUMA scheduling. It doesn't actually solve the problem yet, but it gives us the infrastructure so that various solutions can be experimented with and we can finally find something that, that works really well. So there's a lot of, there's a, well, there's a couple of competing patch sets out there, but they pretty much focus on the same ideas, which include assigning a home node for each process and really trying hard to keep it there and all of its memory there as well. So splitting up your NUMA system and enforcing locality. But then when things do move around, you try to get the memory to follow the process to its new home. So if a process gets moved to a new node, then sort of like ducklings following the mother, all of its pages will slowly follow it across the interconnect and rejoin it in its new home. So you try to you recreate, you tidy things up again when you've broken the locality. And so with this kind of approach, we hope that we can get better NUMA performance and work better on this kind of system, which is important because increasingly our systems are NUMA systems. Even just a simple two-socket system can often be NUMA-like in a lot of its characteristics, and you want to work well on that. So this is a complex scheduling problem, scheduling and memory management problem that's going to be hard to solve. But the thing is that that's not all. There's more that we have to do in the scheduling area. So one thing that is of interest here is power-aware scheduling. Power management, of course, has been of interest for a long time, and that's only increasing. The, the result of a lot of the work that has been done so far is to help us ensure that when there's no work to do, the processors go into a deep sleep state, and they stay there for a long period of time. So when there is no work to do, we're very efficient. In fact, I would claim that Linux is more efficient at doing nothing than anything else out there at this point. Okay. If your system instead is is flat out busy, there's not much scope for power management because you simply need to run everything flat out to get the work done. Um, but all you can really do is, is power clamp, which is not really a power conservation thing. It's, it's more, again, it's a budgeting thing. 
but there's a space in the middle where you have a moderately loaded system where we could be doing better than we are. And so if we pull up my diagram here where we've got eight CPUs, if you've got a system that's moderately loaded, it would be awfully nice if you could simply power down some of those CPUs and do the work on the other processors that are out there. If you can do this, you can use less power. If you're running all those CPUs, then you obviously are consuming a whole lot more power. So there's a couple of approaches that are being taken in patch sets that are out there. And they really come down to this. One is a thing called small task packing. In any Linux system out there, you're going to have a number of processes that are doing really simple little tasks, like updating the, the clock or checking for mail or whatever like that. They don't run for very much time at all. If they are spread out across your system, they will be waking all of your processors, and they will be consuming a lot of power. If you can coalesce them onto a relatively small number of processors, then you can get the work done much more efficiently by just running those processors at full speed till the work is done, and then everything goes to sleep again. So when you've got your small tasks, if you can put them together in this way, you can, you can do better. And there's a couple of patch sets that are out there attempting to implement that. The other side of the coin, though, is that if you have a big task, something that needs a lot of CPU time, it's really better to spread those out, give each one its own processor, let them all get their work done as quickly as possible, and get the system back to an idle state as quickly as you can. So somehow you have to distinguish these two kinds of processes and, and treat them differently. The good news is that as of 3.8, they merged a, a patch set that was called Per-Entity Load Tracking, which gives us much better metrics about the actual CPU demands of every process in the system and every group of processes. And we can make much better decisions about what we're doing with our schedule than we were able to before. And we're just beginning to see the patch sets really making use of this sort of stuff. So this stuff is another, it's another complicated problem. It has to be solved. It has to be solved in the same code that the NUMA problem has to be solved. So those two different sets of criteria have to be simultaneously satisfied in the work that's being done with the schedulers. And that makes the problem a lot more complex. But naturally, um, we're not done yet, because there's more to it than this. What I've been talking about so far are what are called symmetric multiprocessing systems, SMP systems, what we're used to, where every processor is the same. Of course, there are people out there, naturally in the ARM community, who are making systems that aren't like that. And so there's this whole architecture that some clever marketing guy in ARM called Big Dot Little, spelled in just that way, where on the same, on the same chip, you mix a number of very small, slow, but very power efficient processors with a number of very large, very fast, but power hungry processors. So you have slow and efficient or fast and, and hungry. You have them both there, and what you want to do is to somehow schedule work across this set of processors in a way so that you get things done in optimal time. You optimize your throughput, you optimize your power consumption. And this is hard to do because the people who wrote the Linux scheduler did not have this kind of system in mind. Nobody's really written a scheduler that has this kind of stuff in mind. So there's a lot of interesting problems in terms of how do you actually run a system like this. To see the degree of confusion that there is, there's actually three different solutions to big that little circulating right now. Um, first of which, something that came out of ARM, is that you just put a little lightweight hypervisor on the system. And you hide the nature of the system from the kernel altogether. The Linux kernel doesn't even know whether it's running on either all four small processors or all four big processors. And the hypervisor will simply switch between the two depending on how much idle time it sees in the processors that are running. And so you're running only half of your processors and you have to switch the full set one way or the other. It's not an optimal solution, but it worked and it's out there. So we see some of that. That's not really relevant to Linux since it's outside of the kernel. The next solution is called the big dot little switcher. And this takes a very different approach. Now what you do is you take your processors and you bundle them into pairs, a, a pair of one small and one big processor. And you treat them as one logical processor that just happens to have a very wide range of frequency scaling options. So now you can use the, the CPU frequency governor mechanism, which normally just changes the CPU frequency in response to load. And actually, it will switch between the processors depending on the load, as if it were just another frequency change. So again, the rest of the kernel is pretty much unaware of what's going on. It's all hidden in a little bit of CPU frequency code, governor code, and a bit of architecture-specific code. So it's a relatively easy solution, and it's out there now. 
but it's still not really the optimal solution. The best thing, of course, to do would be to teach the scheduler about heterogeneous systems and have it actually schedule tasks with the nature of the system fully in mind. So these patches exist as well. They're called big little MP. And this will be the best solution someday, but this is going to take a little while, I think, because it's a complex problem. And it's, it's going to take a long time to get this code integrated, to say the least. So I think we'll see the big that little switcher code used for, for longer than one might like. So where are these patches? The, the problem is, of course, that none of these are in the mainline kernel at this point. The, the switcher code has not even been publicly posted. They're still waiting for one of the Linaro members to ship a product based on it, something I gave them a bit of grief about a month or so ago. And they may, they may yet release it early, but that has not yet happened. There's some precursor work out there that isn't getting in due to some other problems. The big little MP code is out there if you know where to look for it. And some stuff has been posted on the main kernel list as well, and there's been some discussion of it. But the developers here have expressed some frustration with me because they're having a, a hard time getting review and integration of these patches. They're having a hard time getting this code into the mainline kernel, which is a frustrating position for any developer to be in. But in this case, it, it highlights an interesting situation that I thought was actually worth taking a couple of minutes to talk about. So I'm going to do that. So we can ask, why is it that they're having such a hard time getting this code in? Well, one of, them, one of the reasons is simply that getting code into the scheduler or the virtual memory system, any of these core systems, is just plain hard. These, this code is the embodiment of heuristics that have taken years and years to develop bunch of ways of, of managing the system that we know work well across a very wide range of workloads. As soon as you start to perturb those heuristics, you run a very real risk of creating performance regressions on workloads that you can't even possibly know about. You put in some change to the scheduler and everything seems to work well until somebody at some bank notices that, that their performance has gone way down when they use this new code. And the problem is that they don't notice this until years later when, when this new code has been shipped by an enterprise distributor. And by then, it's really hard to fix problems like this. So it's, it's natural that the people who maintain this code have become very conservative and very defensive. And they really want to see strong evidence that nothing has, has regressed backwards when you merge it in. So it's a very high bar for inclusion. It's hard for anybody to do it. And it's not clear that all the powerware scheduling stuff has, has passed that bar yet in any case. So there's work to be done there. But there's more to it than that. So I want to point out something else as well. Before I put up that plot or that table of the companies that were contributing to the kernel, that it covered the entire kernel, all the whole ball of wax. If you look at specific subsystems, you see a very different picture. So this is what you get if you look at just the ARM architecture subtrees, which is a significant piece of the kernel but it's just the code that makes ARM processors in particular work. And the companies that you see working in this area are just the companies that you would expect to see. There are the companies working in the mobile and embedded areas, the companies that actually create this hardware, the people who want to make sure that this is the stuff, that, that this stuff works well with Linux. Right? These also happen to be the people who are on the front lines for a lot of the power aware scheduling, for the big dot little work, and so on, are the people coming from this part of the industry. Now, if you look at who works on the core kernel, which is where the scheduler is to be found, and the virtual file system, the memory management subsystem, you see a very different list of companies. There's almost no overlap at all. Right now, we're seeing enterprise distributors. We're seeing enterprise storage vendors. We're seeing large enterprises like Google, uh, virtualization vendors, companies like IBM and Oracle. These are not, in general, companies known for a great deal of involvement in the mobile and embedded world. Right? But these are the people who are in charge of the scheduler code. So what we are finding here is that we have a very interesting integration problem. Because we have a new set of scheduler developers, a new set of folks coming in from a different constituency with different requirements. And they're trying to make changes to a body of code that is being maintained by people who have been making it work for many years. Now, lest anybody misunderstand me, let me say up front that the people who maintain the scheduler are not putting up roadblocks. They are not trying to keep this code out. They are not trying to thwart the needs of the mobile and embedded community in any way. Right? There's no bad faith happening here at all. 
But what they are doing is they are working from their particular mindset and from the industry that they know, and they are working to ensure that things continue to work for the, the customers that they have. So what we have to do is we have to integrate these, a new set of scheduler developers, turn them into core scheduler developers as well, and make a bigger core development team for this. And it's going to take a little while to do this, but I think we're going to do it successfully. We've done it many times in the past. But it's, it's an interesting problem, and it's going to take a year or two to play out, I think. It's worth asking the question, because some people do, why, why bother? Maybe what we really need is two kernels. Then the enterprise people could just worry about their stuff. The mobile people could worry about their stuff. And we wouldn't have to deal with people worrying about having their workloads repressed by people from the other side. Whatever that. Something like what was just done with the WebKit, WebKit browsing engine, rendering engine, where it was split off for Chrome to meet their needs and for the other WebKit users over here. So we could do this, and some people have proposed it, especially when I hear this line of reasoning, which I don't hear as much as I used to, but you still hear this every now and then, where people in the mobile and embedded world will say, well, Linux kernel development is dominated by and driven by the needs of enterprise computing. Well, I think that's less true all the time, and it's becoming less true. But let's just think of, let's take this thesis for a moment and say the enterprise people run roughshod over everybody else, and they're, they're running the show and running things to, to their particular needs. Here's a few things that they've inflicted on the mobile embedded world in the process of doing this. Big iron problems, like symmetric multiprocessing, that was so much of an obscure big iron problem when it was first merged into the kernel that a great deal of care was taken to ensure that it did not affect performance on single processor systems in any way. Now you have to kind of work at it to find a single processor system, right? But that was the concern at the time. Supporting a full gigabyte of memory on a 32-bit system, that was a big iron problem once upon a time. We have our enterprise file systems. We have our completely fair scheduler. We have the best networking stack in the world, um, despite what we heard earlier today. Well, I, didn't believe this to <laughs> I believe this to be true, and so on. So the point that I would make is these were all done for the needs of the enterprise, and every single one of these features on this slide is absolutely necessary to make this phone work, right? Something that was yesterday's big iron feature is now a mobile and embedded feature, and you've got to have it. So the mobile embedded community has benefited from this work tremendously. Likewise, a lot of the emphasis on power consumption is coming from the mobile and embedded world and is being very much picked up by the enterprise world because they're discovering that their power bills are kind of expensive and that they want to do better in that area. So there's a lot of value in, in the, the cross-play of, of the needs and making things work for everybody. In fact, I would make the point that the insistence that we can make one kernel that works for everybody for everything from your telephone through to the biggest supercomputers on the planet and everything in between is one of the biggest strengths of the entire Linux operating system. It is why we have a kernel that meets all of our needs. It's why we have a kernel that is still vital and still at the core of everything after more than 20 years is because we have taken this approach. And we're certainly not going to change that now. Because in the end, nobody's needs are quite as special as they think they are. And when we solve the problem for everybody, everybody else benefits from it as well. So we will continue to do that. So just as an aside while we're on this topic, some years ago there was a lot of screaming about Android and their particular forked kernel and all that. So what's going on with that? Because it's gotten quiet. Well, there's a reason it's gotten quiet. And the reason it's gotten quiet is that most of this code is in the mainline kernel now. You can actually run an Android user space on a mainline kernel. We don't have the problems that we used to. But more interestingly, some of this work has been redone. Raphael, who's out there somewhere, did his own version of opportunistic suspend that was, turned out to be a much better solution for the mainline kernel than the Android wake locks mechanism was. So that was what went into the, into the mainline. And the Android folks have quietly switched over and are now using that. So the wake locks problem, which was what all the screaming about, is gone. It's solved. It's fixed. Um, it was fixed in the way that we do things best, by insisting that we have the best solution that we can make. So there's still code that's out of the mainline kernel, such as the memory manager and stuff. Google continues to innovate. They will do other stuff. There will be other stuff that, goes, that they ship that's outside the mainline. 
In this respect, they're an awful lot like enterprise distributors, like the real-time people, and like a whole lot of other folks who develop their code, they ship it, they make it work right, and eventually we figure out how to integrate it into the main line. It's really an example of the system working the way it's supposed to at this point. Um, it's, it's a good example now. It just took us a while to get to where we could say that. So that, that's pretty much what I had to say about scheduling, even though I've gone off of it. But I will say that there are a couple of talks tomorrow uh, by, by people who are at the core of a lot of the scheduling work. There's, there's Preeti's talk and there's, there's Morton Rasmussen's talk. And I would really recommend going to both of those if you're interested in, in that sort of stuff, because I think they're going to be very interesting talks. And I'm going to move on to networking. And I'm really only going to talk about one little piece of networking, even though there's a whole lot that's happening there. One, because I think it's a cool feature, but also because it inter it highlights a problem that, that has been bugging me a little bit. So the feature, oh, okay, that used to be a nice slide, is, is multi-path TCP. Um, if you think about your smartphone, it has at least two network interfaces in it, right? There's the cellular interface, there's the Wi-Fi interface. But you're only using one of them at a time. Typically, you're using the Wi-Fi interface when it's available, cellular or otherwise. And if you walk away from your Wi-Fi access point, any connection you've got going breaks, and things have to be reestablished, and it's really kind of a pain. So what if you could actually use both of those interfaces together and send data over both? Well, there's a couple of advantages that come from this. One of them being better bandwidth. If you want to use your interfaces that way, you can send traffic in parallel over both and move more data than you could using just one of them. But the other aspect is reliability. If these flows can come and go, you have multiple flows going th over different interfaces, then your Wi-Fi session on your phone can transparently shift over to the cellular interface when you leave the house. Then maybe you get to work or somewhere else where you've got Wi-Fi again, and it shifts to that. And these flows can come and go, but the, the higher level connection continues to exist. So you have a much higher level of, of reliability in terms of your connections and all that. So it's useful in mobile environments. It's also actually useful in places like data centers, where systems tend to be very highly interconnected with multiple paths between them. Some paths can be very highly congested. Others are free. If you're using multi-path, you can use them optimally and get the best out of your, your networking resources in the data center as well. So there's a lot of nice stuff that you can do with it. The patches to do this actually exist. They're out there. You can download them and play with them if you want to. They even have some Android kernels if you want to just sort of throw it on your phone. They claim to have established the speed record for TCP, the fastest ever, by running six 10 gigabit interfaces in parallel and running them all flat out at the same time or something pretty close to that. Mainline merging is going to take a little while because this is a very big, very complex patch set. And the networking developers, too, tend to be a little bit conservative about anything that looks like it could cause regressions. So integration will take a while, and that's just to be expected. But I think we will see this in the kernel uh, in the near future. But that's not actually what I'm here to talk about. Um, the interesting part is what I'm starting to see as being a, a net that's increasingly hostile to innovation. Right, this patch set, like I said, is complex. They have to solve a lot of complicated problems, like managing multiple flows, congestion control. Security issues are very interesting when different flows can come and go in the middle of an ongoing connection and so on. But the real challenge, if you look at the code and if you look at the, the RFCs describing it, is not all of this stuff, which is a solvable problem. It's dealing with all the middle boxes on the net. Middle boxes being all the routers that your, nef your network traffic travels through between you and wherever it is that you want to go. These boxes do all kinds of terrible things. They'll change your IP addresses and ports if you're running through a NAT box, add and move flags from TCP packets. They'll change the segmentation of your data. They will um, send acts for data that hasn't actually been delivered yet, totally violating the protocols, but in theory speeding things up a bit. They'll corrupt the data, make changes to things, and they'll block any data that, that looks scary. They'll just throw up the walls and all that. The, the end result of all of this is that if you have a protocol that, doesn't, that looks a little bit funny or a little bit weird, it's kind of like showing up at a TSA checkpoint dressed funny, right? You're going to have trouble. So the, the multi-path TCP people had to create something that looks exactly like TCP, right? If you have a multi-path TCP connection with two flows, it looks like two independent TCP connections to the rest of the network. They, they had to completely hide their protocol as best they could. Because otherwise, it simply it would not be deployable. They could not actually make it work on the real world network. And I think this is, this is an interesting problem. 
Uh, in the Linux world, we're in an interesting place because networking innovation tends to come here first. Things like multipath TCP are implemented on Linux because the platform is there, there's a great network stack to work with, and you can get things deployed very quickly if you get it into Linux. But there's a problem because deploying new protocols on the net has become pretty much impossible due to all of these middle boxes that are out there. We've pretty much fossilized the form of the network. And this is going to bite us someday when we have to make more significant changes. And I have no solutions for this. But it's, it's an interesting problem that we're going to have to keep an eye on. So I'm going to go over a few other things sort of quickly, um, and then I will conclude. But one other area of development that I think is, is worthy of note is the, the big area that's known as namespaces. Namespaces have been under development in the Linux kernel for many years. Uh, five, six, seven years, something like that. It's taken a very long time because it's a complex problem. And it's a piece of the, of the broader containers issue. What you want to do with namespaces is take a process or a group of processes and put them in a container on your system, wall them off from the rest of the, of the system. And then you can use namespaces to lie to the process about its environment. So you can give it a different view of the file system than the rest of the, kernel of the system has. You can lie about what other processes are running, you can even make it think it's running as a different user group than it really is. You can lie about the time, and there's actually there's a module to do that in the kernel because sometimes you want to lie about what time it is. You lie about the networking topology. You create a whole different view of, of the system inside this container. It's a form of virtualization, but it's very different from full hardware virtualization because you're still running on the host kernel. So it's something that's much lighter weight than, than full hardware virtualization. So the keystone piece of this is something that was merged for 3.8 with pieces coming in in 3.9. It's called user namespaces. This allows control of user IDs within the container. So user ID is just a number which identifies which user you're running at. Now with user namespaces, any user, unprivileged user, can create a namespace, run a process inside it, and tell that process that it's running as root. And in fact, it will be running inside the container with full root privileges but limited by the walls of the container. So it can do anything inside there, but in theory, nothing outside of it. So you can do a lot of cool things, like lightweight containerization, security sandboxing, stuff like that. And you can allow ordinary users to experiment with code that previously they could only run as, as with full root privileges. So there's, there's a lot of nice stuff that you can do with it. It's a little problematic at the moment, because we've just grown the attack surface of the kernel considerably. There's an awful lot of kernel code that's written with the idea that if you're running as root, you've already taken control of the system, and there's really no point in trying to defend against you. As soon as you create a user namespace and you allow someone to run as root inside of it, you've changed that assumption. So the result of that is, is a lot of surprising security um, features, <laughs> um, shall we say. <laughs> in fact, three, three more of them were posted today on, on the kernel mailing list. So this stuff will be secure someday. In fact, it will be an important security technology someday. But I wouldn't expect to see this enabled in distributions anytime soon. At least I would hope not, because it would be a really dangerous thing to do at this point. It's just it's the kind of thing that takes a long time to shake out. But it's going to be a very interesting feature in the long run. And so just while I'm on the topic of security, people who have seen me speak before know I tend to get up here and whine about security and how we're not doing well enough with it. And I can do that again, but I'd like to say that I think we're getting better in some ways. There's a lot more active testing going on, and people who are actively working on hardening technologies, like the address space layout randomization patches that are out there now, and so on. So we have people working to, to make the kernel more resistant to attack in ways that even a few years ago we didn't. And I think that's, that's a good thing. So we're getting better, but it's, of course it's not good enough. It's never good enough, because you can't get good enough, but the, the attackers are getting smarter and better motivated and with great resources. So we can never really afford to let up on this. This is one of those problems that just doesn't go away. So the final thing I want to talk about is, is a more general topic, which is um, what I just called innovation. There was a time when people would say that open source or free software doesn't, is not capable of innovating. All we can do is follow taillights. So we'll be following somebody else's taillights to the dark, doing whatever somebody else did first. And that's what open source or free software is good for. And to an extent, perhaps, this was even true, because there, were, there was a period of many years where what we were trying to do was to catch up with what Unix systems and other systems had done ahead of us 
and we still had a lot of work to do to catch up with that. And one interesting aspect of that was that it limited the disagreement over what it was that we wanted to do in our software development because we had a target. We knew what we were aiming for. We were aiming for a better Sun OS or something like that. But we, we achieved that years ago. Right? It's been a long time since we've been trying to do that. And so we've now reached a point where interesting things tend to be done on Linux first, whether it's at the kernel level or at the higher levels. An awful lot of the innovative work that is happening out there is happening in the free software world, and it's happening on Linux. So this is a great thing, but it leads to an interesting problem in that if we were once following those taillights through the dark, well, those taillights have kind of faded away, and we're now navigating completely in the dark. So we have to figure out where it is that we're going to go. And that's fine. We can do this. We can experiment in a lot of interesting ways. But that means there's no longer a single target that we're aiming for. And so what we're seeing is a whole lot more disagreement over the directions of our kernel, the directions of our user space, than we used to because people are doing new stuff. And I think it's a good thing, but it, it, it does lead to a lot of public squabbles. And I don't expect to see that go away anytime soon. So what you see is, um, what we're seeing is, what we think of, as a, of a, as a Linux system is changing a bit over time. For a long time, pretty much anything that was called Linux looked like this. You had the kernel, you throw the GNU C library on top of it, toss in the System 5 init system, the X11 windowing system, and then maybe you could argue a little bit over which desktop environment you wanted to use because um, you have to have something to argue about. But pretty much every Linux system looked like this, right? Then we started seeing things like Android, where now you take a slightly off-color kernel, and you um, add a different C library to it completely. You have a different init system. You have a different graphical system and a different you know, desktop, so to speak, layer on top of it. So this is, we think of this as a Linux system. It runs the Linux kernel, but it's a very different Linux system than we were used to before. Then you throw in something like the Ubuntu Touch architecture that they're coming together now, where you still have the kernel. Maybe back to GNU Lib C. Ubuntu Canonical hasn't said they're going to start their Lib C own Lib C project yet, but um, we'll see about that. Um, but they have their own in this system. They have started their own graphical display system because we didn't have enough of those, and um, and they have their own desktop environment because we didn't have enough of those either. So what we have is, I mean, it's an interesting system, and they're doing a lot of, I mean, I'm, I'm poking fun at them, but they're doing some interesting stuff. And, um, and I wouldn't want to discourage this, actually. It's, I mean, if you've played with the Ubuntu Touch system, when it works, it works very nicely. Um, but the point is that this, again, is a very different view of what a Linux system is, OK? So the, the notion of what is Linux has become much, much hazier before. So we're seeing a lot of innovation, a lot of diversity, a lot of fun. But you have to ask this question. Are we getting back to a point where everybody is trying to distinguish themselves from everybody else to the extent that we're getting back to the fragmentation that, that wrecked Unix way back when? Are we heading that way? And I think the answer is that so far, no. And I think that that's partly because we do have a unifying kernel underneath it all. And it's pretty easy to take one of those systems and turn it into one of the other ones just by slapping a few layers of software onto it. So there are people who run Debian on their Android phones and things like that. You can do this, right? So we're still there, but we need to keep this in mind because, um, because it did cause a lot of trouble for, for Unix. And it could cause trouble for us if we're not careful and if we can't keep our communities as a whole well integrated and working well together. So um, on that cheery note, I'm uh, pretty much done at this point. It looks like I have about 2 minutes and 40 seconds for questions if there is a question. Um, probably not more than time for that. Otherwise, I'll get out of the work and I'll let Dirk talk right out of the way. And let Dirk. It looks like I've talked you all into the ground. So I'll thank you all very much. <laughs>